Classifying chemical reactions. A precipitation reaction is one in which dissolved substances react to form one or more solid products. Um, sometimes this reaction is called a double displacement or a double replacement or a metathesis reaction. So there's lots of names for this one. Um, but essentially what happens is that cations and anions in the solution trade partners and create different compounds. And sometimes those compounds are not soluble in water. And so a dissolved compound will precipitate or become an undissolved compound because it's not, no longer soluble when those two new ions mix together. So in order to understand a precipitation reaction where something becomes um, undissolved, which is also coming out of, we call that coming out of solution, um, or we also call that precipitation or precipitating. So uh, it's important to understand how um, solid compounds dissolve in water to understand in why they might undissolve or why they might precipitate. So um, an ionic compound like salt, like sodium chloride, is, consists of positive sodium cations and negative chloride anions. And remember, plus and minus stick together like magnets because they, that's literally what magnets are, plus and minus. So these pluses and minuses are held together like magnets when they're um, in, in a solid form, so like solid salt crystals. But then when we pour the salt into water and those crystals seem to disappear into the water, what's happening is that the plus and minus that's holding the, the solid together starts to get broken apart as the water interferes with those charges, with those plus and minus charges. So what, the reason that water does that is because water has some charges on it as well. Um, and we'll get into this more later in, in the class uh, because water is a covalent compound. It's made of nonmetals, oxygen and hydrogen. And so oxygen and hydrogen are sharing electrons. So they're not ions. So they don't have charges like an ionic compound where um, the anion steals an electron and so both both particles become charged. When atoms are sharing electrons, like the oxygen atom here and the hydrogen atoms down here in a water molecule, they're sharing electrons, so the compound um, isn't charged, but they are not sharing the electrons evenly. The oxygen keeps most of the electrons in this bond. Remember, a bond consists of two electrons. Well, most of the electrons in this bond are next to oxygen. Remember, oxygen also has these two lone pairs. So there's eight electrons altogether in, um, in a molecule of water. And almost all eight of them are right next to oxygen. And you see what that means is that oxygen is kind of stealing these electrons from hydrogen, kind of like an ionic bond where one atom steals electrons from another. Well, the oxygen is trying to steal those electrons from hydrogen, and that gives hydrogen a plus charge, because if you lose your electrons, you become positive. And that gives oxygen a minus charge, because if you gain more electrons, you become negative. But these, are, these aren't full plus and minus charges. They're partial plus and minus charges. So they have these special symbols. So because water is charged like this, it can um, pull apart the charges in an ionic compound, in a soluble ionic compound. So sodium and chloride and salt are stuck together like magnets. But when I put a salt crystal in water, the water molecules have their own charges, plus and minus charges. And the positive cation, the sodium cation, gets attracted to the negative part of water. And the negative anion gets attracted to the positive part of water. So water is able to pull the plus and the minus apart from each other. It separates the plus and minus because the plus and minus kind of gets stuck to water instead. So this is a crystal of salt.
There's lots and lots and lots of molecules of water if you have a, a cup of water and you put a crystal of salt in there. Well, the molecules of water can surround the ions. They kind of get close to the edge, and then lots of water molecules will surround one of these and pull it apart. And then water molecules will surround one of these and pull the next one and pull the next one. And eventually that crystal of salt becomes dissolved and we can't see it anymore. It didn't go anywhere, it just became separated because the water molecules are pulling all of those ions apart and separating them. Uh, and really the charges are being replaced because this positive charge right here used to be surrounded by negative charges in the ionic lattice. And now this positive charge is still surrounded by negative charges because the water is negative. And this negative here used to be surrounded by positive charges in the ionic lattice. Well, the negative is still surrounded by positive charges because all of those hydrogen atoms have a slight positive charge on water. So water can kind of create its own lattice-like structure to pull the ionic lattice apart. And that's what happens when a compound dissolves. So the solid, solid ions go in, solid crystals go in, and when they go in the water, the water pulls the pluses and the minuses apart, and then the water is free to move because uh, water being a liquid, those particles move around inside of the liquid. So the water moves around and it carries these ions around there with it. So you can see as the ions go in, they get separated and they start moving around. And they kind of move around in the solution um, in a straight line until they run into another particle. And then they'll bounce off that particle and then they'll go in another straight line and then they'll hit the edge of the container and bounce off the edge and go in another straight line. So the particles kind of act like gas particles where they just kind of move in a straight line until they hit the edge or hit another particle and just bounce around in straight lines. So if I put lots of salt crystals in here, make my computer go really slow, So eventually, what you'll see happen is that a lot of them broke apart that I dropped in there and started floating around as dissolved particles. But there's this big chunk now that kind of sit, is sitting on the bottom of the beaker. Well, if you've ever tried to make salt water before and you pour the salt in and you keep stirring and stirring and stirring, well, eventually the salt stops dissolving and you get salt piling up on the bottom of the cup. Well, that's what's happening here too. Eventually, as the salt dissolves and these particles are carried off by water, the water gets full of particles. It can't hold any more particles because all of the water molecules are busy carrying particles around. There's not any more available water particles to dissolve any more of the solid. So the solid just ends up sitting on the bottom. Um, we call this a saturated solution. Saturated means it has all of the particles that it can hold and it can't hold any more dissolved particles. So how do I uh, make a saturated solution unsaturated? Well, I can dilute. If I add water, maybe if we add water, then we are adding more water particles and more water particles will be free to uh, pull apart the dissolved ions or pull apart the solid ions and dissolve them. So we add more water and then eventually you can see that there's enough water molecules now to dissolve all of those salt particles and um, now my solution is unsaturated. So I don't know that it's saturated until I start seeing solid stuff pile up on the bottom. So right now we would call it unsaturated. So when I put a ionic compound into water and the plus and the minus get separated by the water like we just saw, we call that ionic compound soluble. 
if I put an ionic compound into, um, into water, and even, it, even if it's pure water and it doesn't have any of this in there yet, and I put it in there and it falls to the bottom and it doesn't disappear, and the water doesn't separate those ions, then we call that insoluble. So something can be insoluble because the, comp because the solution is already saturated, like we just saw. If a solution is saturated in dissolved ions, and if I try to put more in there, then it won't dissolve. And it will kind of look like this, and it'll just sit on the bottom. But if I have pure water that doesn't have any ions in it, and I try to put something in there that's insoluble, the very first crystal will sink to the bottom, and none of those ions will separate. They will just sit, it'll just be a solid rock inside water, just like a solid rock outside of water. You can imagine just like putting a rock in water. If you put a rock in water, it's not going to dissolve, depending on, you know, most rocks that you'd find outside. So, <clears throat> um, um, ion, some ionic compounds um, dissolve in water, and some ionic compounds don't dissolve in water. So just because an ionic compound has a, is made of pluses and minuses, and water is made of pluses and minuses, doesn't mean that water can separate all of them. It can only separate some of them. So um, ionic compounds are also called salt. So this is a salt. Sodium chloride is a salt because it's ionic. Silver nitrate is a salt because it's ionic. Sodium chloride is a salt because it's ionic. And it also happens to be called table salt, which is what we eat. And sometimes we just call it salt, and you put salt on your food. So salt, in the sense of what you put on your food, is an ionic compound called sodium chloride. But when we start saying salt in this class, we're referring to any ionic compound. All ionic compounds are called salts. So here's what a precipitation reaction looks like. A precipitation reaction is where I have something that's dissolved, that's soluble, potassium iodide. It looks like this, the ions are separated. And then lead nitrate, it looks like this, the ions are separated. So I have a solution of uh, potassium iodide up here. I have a solution of lead nitrate down here, the clear parts. And when I mix them together, right here where the potassium iodide and the lead nitrate start to mix, what happens is this yellow compound seems to come out of nowhere. Well, it didn't come out of nowhere. The yellow compound is lead atoms and iodine atoms stuck together. They get, when they see each other, they get stuck. So here, iodide and potassium, water can separate those. Here, lead and nitrate, water can separate those. But here, lead and iodide, water can't separate that combination. When these gold ones and these purple ones run into each other because they get mixed down here, oops, because they get mixed in the bottom, as soon as they run into each other, they get stuck. They don't bounce off. They get stuck and they fall to the bottom. And every time a gold one hits, it gets stuck. And every time a purple one hits, it gets stuck. So they all, all of the purple and gold atoms get stuck together. And when that happens, we see this effect in the water that's called precipitation. So <clears throat> the K and the I, potassium and iodide, were soluble. Water could separate them. The lead and the nitrate were soluble. Water could separate them. The potassium and the nitrate are soluble down here. Water, these are still separated. The potassium came from the top um, solution. The nitrate came from the bottom solution. But even when they mix, potassium and nitrate mix together, they're still soluble. So the potassium bounces right off the iodide in solution. They bounce right off and go on their way. The potassium bounces right off the nitrate. It bounces right off and doesn't stick. The lead bounces right off the nitrate and doesn't stick. But if the lead bounces into the purple one, when we mix these two solutions together, then they get stuck, and they make a precipitate, and it falls to the bottom. So we, whether a compound is soluble or insoluble, it, we call that property solubility. So um, we can measure the solubility of a compound, and um, when we're talking about 
quantitative solubility, we can say that that's the maximum amount, the maximum concentration of a substance that can be achieved under specified conditions. So if I'm making this glass of salt water and I'm pouring salt in, the moment before the salt starts to pile up on the bottom of the glass, we would call that the solubility of water at that temperature. So at, at room temperature, for example. So um, some substances, I can dissolve a lot of them in there, like salt or water or, or sugar. Salt and sugar will dissolve to a large extent in water. So we would call those substances soluble. Um, but some substances won't dissolve, like sand. If you put sand in water, it's not going to dissolve at all. The sand just sinks to the bottom. Sand is made of a compound called silicon dioxide. And so we would say silicon dioxide is insoluble, just sinks to the bottom. So um, compounds, uh, some ions can be soluble when they're with, when their partner is uh, a certain anion. So like we saw here, the lead is soluble when it's with nitrate, but the lead is not soluble when it's with iodine. So certain combinations of ions are insoluble and certain combinations of ions are soluble. So it's not like lead is always insoluble with everything. Lead is soluble when it's paired up with nitrate. It's just not soluble if it's paired up with iodine. So here's some rules. Um, <clears throat> soluble compounds contain group one metal cations or ammonium. So group one ions are um, the ones in the first column, sodium, potassium, and so on. And ammonium ion <clears throat> is this, NH4+. Plus. So anytime I have any of the group one ions, sodium, potassium, lithium, so on, or ammonium, those are always soluble compounds. Um, halide ions, chloride, fluoride, bromide, iodide. These are always soluble, except here are the exceptions. Halides of silver, mercury, and lead are not soluble, like we just saw. Lead and iodide, that's not soluble. That will, that'll make a precipitate and it will sink to the bottom. Mercury and iodide, mercury and bromide, mercury and chloride. All of these cations and, and these anions will make insoluble compounds. But if I mix these cations with these anions, they'll all be soluble because these are all on the soluble side. All right, soluble compounds contain acetate, bicarbonate, nitrate, and chlorate. So acetate is C2. H three O two minus. Remember these polyatomic ions. Bicarbonate is H C O three minus. That's what's in baking soda. Nitrate is N O three minus, and chlorate is C L O three minus. So just like if a compound has these ions, it's soluble. If it has these ions, it's soluble. If it has these ions, that compound is soluble too. Sulfate ion. Sulfate is SO42 minus. So any compound with a sulfate ion is soluble, except sulfates of silver, barium, calcium, mercury, lead, and strontium. So most sulfates are soluble, but these six sulfates are not. Silver sulfate, barium sulfate, calcium sulfate, those would all be insoluble compounds. So these, um, these ions are almost always insoluble. So carbonate, CO32- is almost always insoluble. Chromate, CrO4, 2 minus, almost always insoluble. Phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. Sulfide, S2 minus. These are almost always insoluble unless they're um, 
compounds with group one metal ions are ammonium, so these. So if these ions right here are paired up with these ions down here, they'll be soluble. But if anything else is paired up with these ions down here, it will be insoluble. And hydroxide. Anything paired up with a hydroxide ion is insoluble, except these and barium. So it seems like these are a lot of rules, but surprisingly, it's not really that many rules when we consider how many possibilities there are and how many different compounds there are. This explains most of the solubility of, of ionic compounds in water. So remember these. Anytime you see any of these, and we'll finish this off, So we also have rubidium and cesium. So anytime a compound has any of these ions, it's always soluble. Every compound with these ions is soluble. Every compound with these ions down here is soluble. These ions are always soluble with any ion. Any compound with these ions are always soluble, except these. All sulfates are soluble, except these. All of these are insoluble. Right? Basically, all of these are insoluble, except the ones that come from this group. So this is, um, you can have this list when you're doing your test. It's okay to have this list nearby. It's okay to use this when you're working on your homework. But it's a good idea to start to become familiar with these so you don't have to search for the answer every time you do a problem like this. Start to recognize compounds with these ions and say, oh yeah, those are always soluble. Oh yeah, these are always insoluble. So just start to become familiar with this chart. Uh, when we write precipitation reactions, there's a special way that we're supposed to write the equation. So we have what we have uh, described up to this point as being called the molecular equation, which is where I have reactants on the left side, and those reactants have their phase. So this is AQ, is remember aqueous solution. So an aqueous solution of calcium chloride plus an aqueous solution of silver nitrate. And when I mix those together, I get an aqueous solution of calcium nitrate and a solid silver chloride. And this solid right here, this is the precipitate. So um, if I mix a solution, AQ, with another solution, AQ, and I make a solution, AQ, and another solution, AQ, then it didn't actually, nothing actually changed in the reaction. The only way that we have a chemical reaction happening is if I mix these two solutions together and I generate a solid. And then we call that kind of reaction a precipitation reaction. So let's see how we um, manipulate these formulas to generate the product. So how do I know if I didn't give you this half of the equation, how would you know what was going to happen when you mixed these two together? Well, it's actually simpler than it looks. Each of these compounds is made up of two parts. A cation, we'll circle the cation first. All right, so remember, a cation is always a metal, and it always is the first atom in a formula. So let's circle cations over here too. Now we'll put a green circle around the anion. So here's an anion. Here's an anion, polyatomic. Polyatomic anion, 
chloride is an anion. So each of these uh, molecules is really made up of So you can see what happened in this reaction was that the anions just switch places. All right, so on the left I have Ca is with Cl. But then they switch places, so on the right Ca is with NO3 with the other anion. And then on the left I have Ag with NO3, but then they switch places. So then on the left on the right I have Ag with Cl. So really all that happened was that B and D here just swapped places. The NO3 goes over here, the Cl goes over here. So let's write these ions out. Ca is calcium and if we find this in the periodic table is one way you can remember its charge. Ca2 plus. Um, and then I have chloride here. Cl and we find it in the periodic table and remember its charge is minus, minus one. Silver is a transition metal. So it's hard to figure out its charge just by looking in the periodic table. But silver is a transition metal that really only has one charge. Silver is only ever plus one. Um, and NO3, if we know that silver is plus one, and I have one NO3, then I could reason that NO3 is minus one. So then on this side, let's do the same thing. I have Ca2 plus NO3 minus again. Ag plus Cl minus. So this is what these ions look like. If they were to dissolve, and I pull these ions apart in water, for example, they would look like this. So let's um, see now, it's easier to see what's happening is that calcium is, is paired up with chloride because plus and minus are attracted. But the plus, the calcium here, it could be attracted to this minus. Or if I mix it together, this plus could be attracted to this minus, right? And same with this. This plus in solution could be attracted to this minus. But if there's other minuses around, this plus could be attracted to this minus too. So it's easy to see that when all four of these things are floating around in water, they're all floating around together, bumping into each other. If two of these bump into each other that create an insoluble compound, then they'll stick and they'll fall to the bottom, just like we saw. So it turns out that two of them do that, silver and chloride. And how would I know that? Well, I would go back to my solubility table, and say, OK, soluble compounds contain, oh, halogen ions, halide ions, it's like Cl minus. So that means that this must be soluble, except that the insoluble exceptions are silver, mercury, and lead. So I have a silver with a halogen, which is chloride. Remember, chloride is Cl minus, oops. So I used my solubility table, and I would look at these compounds and say, OK, well, anything with nitrate is soluble, so this must be soluble. Anything with a halogen is soluble, except silver. So silver chloride must be insoluble, according to my solubility rules. So I would write an S after this one. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to look at on this one before we move on is um, to keep track of these coefficients, or excuse me, the subscripts when we're looking at these ions and what happens to the subscript. So sure, we wrote down that uh, Cl minus is my ion, but don't forget that there's a 2 here, and the 2 says I have 2 Cl. So when I break it apart, I would put the 2 out front.
and here I have two silver nitrates. So if I have two silver nitrates, then that means I have two silvers, and I have two nitrates. Here, calcium has a two plus charge. I can find that by looking in the periodic table. NO3 has a minus one charge. I can find that by looking in a table of polyatomic ions. But there's a two after NO3, so that means I have two NO3 minus ions, and only one calcium, because there's no subscript here. Here I have two silver chloride. So that means I have two silver and two chloride, because the two in front applies to both. It means silver chloride. When I have one of these, I have one silver and one chloride. When I have two, then I have two silvers and two chlorides. So keeping track of the subscripts and keeping track of how many of these ions you have, it, this is, an, this is um, what we're going to do next when we look at what's called the ionic equation, is that we uh, try to separate these ions, make sure that everything is balanced, and then try to look for the insoluble compound. So we can see here that I have one calcium on the left and one calcium on the right. Two chlorides on the left, two chlorides on the right. Two silvers on the left, two silvers on the right. Two nitrates on the left, two nitrates on the right. So this is a balanced equation. It's balanced. I have all the same atoms, the same number and same type of atoms on each side. So um, we just saw this. When ionic compounds dissolve, they dissociate into their dis uh, constituent ions, if they're soluble. So calcium chloride, I put it in water. It becomes Ca2 plus and 2 Cl minus, like we just saw. I put silver nitrate in water. It becomes 2 silver plus and 2 NO3 minus. So this is a very, very important skill to be able to look at an ionic compound and say, if this dissolves in water, what is it going to turn into? Well, if this dissolves in water and the ions separate, then I have one ion that's a Ca2+, and I have two ions that are NO3-, and I know that because of the subscript here. So practice doing this, taking a chemical formula, an ionic chemical formula. It has to be ionic, so make sure there's a metal in front, otherwise it won't work. And try to separate the ionic compound into its ions and put the charge of the ions, just like this. Okay, so here's another example. I would uh, look at my equation, uh, my molecular equation, and separate all of those compounds out like this. So let me, I'm going to draw the, the molecular equation right up here. I have lead, Nitrate, aqueous, plus two KCl aqueous, makes PbCl2 solid, plus 2KNO3 aqueous. So here, up here, this is my complete molecular equation. And in a molecular equation, I use chemical formulas that are not broken apart. But then when I break them apart, like this, this breaks apart into these ions, one lead and two NO3 minuses. And when that happens, um, I break all of these apart, then I get an equation that looks like this. This is called an ionic equation, because here I'm representing all of these as ions. So when I write an ionic equation, I can only break apart the ones that are dissolved, and only the ones that say AQ are dissolved. Anything that says S is not actually dissolved, it's actually a solid, and a solid, the the pluses and the minuses don't break apart. They stay together. That's why it's solid, because they can't break apart. Only the AQ ones break apart, because AQ means they have separated. So when I write these down here, lead, nitrate, PbNO3, 
This is AQ, it's aqueous solution, so that means it's separated, it's dissolved. So I'll separate it. This ion is separated from this ion. All right, potassium chloride. AQ, it's aqueous, that means it's dissolved, so I'll separate. K plus, Cl minus. Come to the next one. PBCl2, this is solid. That means it does not separate. These ions are really, really sticky and they're stuck together and water cannot separate them. So PBCl2 in my ionic equation is PBCl2 because it can't break apart. So it stays the same, it's solid. They're really, really sticky. But KNO3, that's aqueous. That's a solution, which means that they're separated. So down here, I'll write them as separated. So this is how I'll turn a molecular equation into an ionic equation, a complete ionic equation. Now for most of these, like Cl, you look on the periodic table to find its charge. K, you look on the periodic table to find its charge. NO3, you can look on a table of polyatomic ions to find its charge. But lead is one of those transition metals. How do you know the charge of lead? You look on the periodic table, but it has different charges. Well, remember when I have a compound, PbNO3, two, just like we could use the switcheroo to generate this formula if I knew the charges of the ions, right? I go like this, the plus, two plus becomes the subscript of my nitrate, and the one minus becomes the subscript of my lead, right? Well, I can use the reverse switcheroo to turn a chemical formula like this into ions that are separated. How do we do that? Well, separate them. Pb and NO3, they're separated now. Now, use the subscripts to turn into charges. The subscript on NO3 becomes the charge on lead. And the subscript on lead, remember, which is 1, becomes the charge on NO3. So I can use a formula like this to generate my ions that are split apart like this. That information is contained inside this formula. You just have to know how to read it the right way. Just do the reverse switcheroo, and you can turn that formula into separated ions that have charges. OK, so let's recognize that on the left side and the right side, I have a couple of um, ions that are the same. NO3, NO3, K plus, K plus. Lead 2 plus is on the left, but lead 2 plus is not on the right because what happened to it? It got stuck to chloride. Chloride is on the left, but it's not on the right. Why? because it got stuck to lead. So this thing and this thing bumped into each other in the solution, and when they bumped into each other, they got stuck, and they became solid lead chloride. But these, potassium and nitrate bumped into each other, and nothing happened. And they're potassium and they're nitrate on this side, and they just keep bumping into each other. So if I have ions on one side and ions on the other side that don't change, then those are called spectator ions. And what does a spectator do? They just sit around and watch, right? The spectators at the sports at the sports arena, they just sit around and watch. So spectators don't participate in the reaction. They just sit around and watch. So what that means is that I'm not really concerned about spectator ions. The only thing are, that's really happening in this reaction, because those guys just keep bouncing off of each other, they're not doing anything. What is happening, though, is this runs into this, and it makes this. So that's really what's happening in this chemical reaction. That's the important part of this chemical reaction. So I create a molecular equation. We break it apart into an ionic equation like this. We cancel out the spectator ions. And then we're left with what's called the net ionic equation. And the net ionic equation just takes what's left from the reactant side and what's left from the product side and makes a new equation with it. Well, this is actually what's happening. This is the chemical change that's occurring in this solution. Lead 2 plus runs into two chlorides and makes PBCl2 solid, the precipitate. So this is the most important part of the equation. 
We call this the net ionic equation. And this is really what we want to represent when we're talking about a precipitation reaction. All right, so here is another example. Here's the molecular equation. I have Ki, which is aqueous. It's dissolved. That means it separates. Lead nitrate is aqueous. That means it separates. PBI2 is solid. That means it doesn't separate. And KNO3 is aqueous, which means it does separate. So if we were to break this and do a complete molecular e equation, I have 2Ki, which means I have 2K plus plus 2I minus, because it breaks apart. PBNO3 is aqueous, it breaks apart. So that means I have PB2 plus, and I have 2NO3 minus. Now on this side, PBI2 is solid, that means it doesn't break apart. PBI2 solid, it just copies right down, exactly the same. I don't change it at all. And potassium nitrate, I have 2KNO3, so that means I have 2K plus and 2NO3, 1 minus. So this is my complete ionic equation. So now identify spectators. The spectator ions are potassium and nitrate. And when we leave the spectators out, what we're left with is lead 2 plus, just kind of reverse them, lead 2 plus plus 2i minus makes lead iodide, lead 2 iodide. So this is how we are going to um, generate net ionic equations from molecular equations in precipitation reactions. Let's try this one. Na plus, this is aqueous, so it does so they separate. Cl minus, this is aqueous, so they separate. Ag plus, plus NO3 minus. This is solid, so they don't separate. AgCl solid. Plus, this is aqueous, they do separate. Na plus, plus NO3 minus. We find our spectators, Na. NO3, and what we're left with is silver plus chloride makes silver chloride solid. Those are the pieces that are left in our reaction when we're done. So identifying, um, identifying the spectators and writing net ionic equations is a really important skill for this chapter. You can see that a trick to identifying the spectators is to look for the aqueous compound on the product side. Whatever is aqueous on this side, those are the spectators, sodium and nitrate. Nitrate, sodium, and then what are we left with? Silver, chloride, silver chloride. So the aqueous species on the product side always contains the spectator ions.